as far as the heading there, is the kingdom of God in prototype. And so that's what we were talking about last week. And this is the continuation of it, and it should conclude that, that section by the time we get finished with this page. So... Page 6 at the top right there. I'll probably have to leave at halftime. Huh? I'm sorry? I'll probably have to leave at halftime. At halftime. Okay. All right. Halftime. Don't leave after the first quarter. <laughs> All right. I'll lead us in a word of prayer, and then we can get uh, continue with our study this evening, if you'll bow with me. Father, we do ask your blessings upon our study tonight. We need you, we depend on you, and we thank you for delivering your word to us. Help us, Father, to glean the truth, to put it into our hearts. We pray that you'd bless us in our efforts, Father, to uphold your truth and to help others to see the great glory of Jesus Christ. Forgive us for our sins. Give us strength and stability. And thank you, Father, for your blessings every day. We pray in the name of Jesus, your Holy Son. Amen. So as you can see there from the top of the page, uh, the prototypical stage is a cru crucial stage in God's developing plan to establish his eternal kingdom. That's a summary of where we are in our class, and the whole point of the class is talking about God establishing a kingdom that will last forever. And we have been going historically through His developing plan. And last week we began the stage that we called the kingdom in prototype, and that is the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was a prototypical kingdom, or a prototype of God's eternal kingdom. And so we talked about what that idea of prototype is. It's just kind of a, it was supposed to be a, a grand little example of what it means to have God rule and reign over his kingdom. But it was just the small kingdom in, um, amid all the kingdoms in the world, wasn't it? But God wanted to take that one kingdom and rule there so that it could be a beacon for everyone in the world to look to and say, that's where the Creator's kingdom is, that's where His rule is. And so that was the ideal uh, circumstance, but as we'll see tonight, it didn't really work out that way because even Israel rebelled against God's will. So that was kind of the problem as it ended up. But we're going to look at that. But I first want to go back and open to Deuteronomy chapter 10, if you will. Deuteronomy 10. And we're going to read verses 14 and following. There you can see in your notes, uh, number one under letter C at the top of the page there says, While God worked with Israel, He developed a clearer picture of the nature of His final kingdom. That's what I just mentioned. God's holiness and absolute authority is to be revered above all else. That's what it means to have... God ruling over his kingdom, that people recognize his absolute authority. Uh, and we're supposed to reverence that above everything else. And I have there that the book of Deuteronomy strives to impress this truth on Israel's minds, for sure. And so let's look what Moses says to Israel in Deuteronomy 10 and verse 14. that says, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, and also the earth with all that is in it. So you see, that's what we've been saying. The whole creation belongs to God, but He's allowed them free will, and with their free will, they've rebelled. It doesn't negate the fact that He's still Creator, but He has allowed them to go their way. But, verse 15, the Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them. So this was what we talked about in the kingdom and promise when we said God chose who out of the nations? You said it? Well, he, whose descendants? Yeah, but it goes back before Jacob to 
Abraham. He chose Abraham out of the nations and said, I'm going to make you a special nation. And then that was Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob, right? So those are the fathers that's mentioned here. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them. So all of the creation belongs to him, but he chose unique, special line of people here. And it says, he chose their descendants after them, you, above all the peoples, even as it is this day. And so therefore circumcise the foreskin of your hearts and be stiff-necked no longer. So don't be like all those nations around you that rebel against the Lord. Instead, be obedient to Him. Verse 17, because the Lord your God is, a, is the God of all the gods, is the Lord of all the lords. The great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing and so forth. And so you're supposed to do the same thing. Look at verse 20. You shall fear the Lord your God, and you shall serve him. And it's to him that you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. Therefore you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his commandments, uh, his judgments always. So this was what we talked about last week when God entered into a covenant with these people and made them the nation, a special nation to him. And he said, your terms of the covenant will be that you will commit to following me and obeying my commandments. That's good enough. Now, what about God's side of things? What was he going to commit to do? Keep his his promises. Of course, the ultimate promise was, I'm going to bless all the nations through your seed eventually somehow. But it was still a little bit cloudy as to what all that meant. But that was a promise he made to Abraham. But we're going to look here in chapter 11 at some of the specific promises that God says, I will keep if you keep up your end of the covenant and don't break it, right? So look at Deuteronomy 11, verse 13 and following. It shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart, with all your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain, the latter rain, that you may gather your grain, your new wine, your oil, and I will send grass in your fields and your livestock, that you may eat and be filled. Are you seeing the point? He's basically saying it's like this covenant that we talked about between a king and a subservient king. If you keep your obedience to me, then I will make sure that you're protected and you're blessed and you will prosper. And so that's what it means for God to say, I'm choosing one nation out of all. I'm going to work specifically with this nation in order to establish my kingdom. <clears throat> and this... Uh, nation of Israel was a prototypical stage in this great eternal kingdom that God is seeking to establish. So that is the, the, the last uh, sentence there under letter C at the top of the page. It says, so long as God's sovereign rule is obeyed, the kingdom of God will prosper. So we don't have time to read through all those verses, but we just read through some of them there. So that's the idea. Now, How did this work out? Now, of course, immediately we know the next, what's the next book after Deuteronomy? It's Joshua, and that records that God actually brought them into the land. And they did conquer their enemies, and they did settle the tribes in the land of Canaan. And they began to um, inherit, they they inherited the land, and, and it was flowing with milk and honey. You remember all of that? But eventually, things went south, right? Because Israel began to rebel against God. So that's letter D on your outline here. It says, history bears out that eventually the citizens of Israel succumbed to the temptation to be what? Like the other kingdoms around them. Boy, that's always a difficulty, isn't it? You see the world around you and you get enamored at certain things and you're like, ooh, I want to be like that. And you don't stop and think, wait a minute, now what's the big picture here? What what am I supposed to be after? I'm after allegiance to my Creator. And I want to obey Him because I know He has a plan that He's working out and it's going to come to fruition one day and, and I want to be faithful. 
but sometimes we get very short-sighted, don't we? And we get, uh, we lose sight of what really matters, and that's what's going on here. So we're going to turn to 1 Samuel 8 and see this. It's there cited on your notes. It says that they, they wanted an earthly king, doesn't it? So look with me in 1 Samuel chapter 8, because this is where it's recorded. So we've moved forward in Israel's history. And as far as this kingdom motif is concerned, this is the next important development. So 1 Samuel chapter 8. I was in 2 Samuel 8, so that's why it's taking me a long time to get there. All right. Uh, for instance, uh, the, verse 4 says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways, so now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. This thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Go ahead and heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, because they have not rejected you, but they have what? They've rejected me. This was not something that was pleasing to the Lord. And he's saying they don't really want me to be their only king. They don't want me to be their king. They want to be like the nations. So this is the, the crisis that Samuel is facing, realizing that they're not acting like the prototypical kingdom of God, where God is the king. Yes. I'm sorry? That's okay. I'm sorry? And Samuel. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people. Oh, you're just talking about how did God speak to Samuel? Yes. Oh, well, it doesn't say. Uh, uh, well, I'm asking you. Yeah. Well, this really gets us a field here, uh, far afield, because we know that God sp speaks to the fathers in various ways, right? Uh, in various ways and at various times, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets. Um, so, uh, let me just sum it up this way. Okay. Sometimes God appeared to people, to his, the people he's speaking to as a human being. So you remember when Abraham was in his tent and he saw three men coming, two of them were angels that appeared like men. And one of them was God himself that appeared like man. So it just, it was, a, an anthropomorphism. It was a, a God appearing as a man. So he sat down with him, and he eat his food, and he began talking with him back and forth. Sometimes he'll speak to him in dreams. So they'll have a dream that God speaks to them, but something about this dream is vivid enough for them to think, the Lord just spoke to me in this dream, right? Uh, sometimes he'll send a prophet, and the prophet will actually say, thus says the Lord, and speak to them that way. So I guess, uh, in short, it's just there's various ways. A vision, sometimes you fall into a trance. Some of these men... And they see it's like a movie theater, I guess. Like there's a screen up there and then something happens and then it's as if you're, you're hearing the audio of a movie, you know. Yeah. They know it's God or a burning bush. Or a burning bush. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so there's just all kinds of ways. Okay. But uh, that's, that's the best I know how to address it right now. Uh, but um, it's an interesting study, no doubt. Um, so, anyway... But the Lord is speaking to Samuel clearly. We believe it because the text here is saying that's what's going on. And this desire to have an earthly king is not pleasing to the Lord. But he's saying, you know, go ahead and give it to them. This is what they want. So this is, again, the Lord allowing, allowing us freedom to make choices. And he, he's not always just going to override your choice. He's going to give you freedom to make these kinds of choices and sometimes let you suffer the consequences of desiring to rebel against his will. Uh, so, number one under letter D there says, Under Saul, God's kingdom operated under the sovereignty of a mere man for the first time. So, it's Saul here that I have in red on your notes. Uh, he's the first king. So, not only does God say, well, they're clamoring for a king, so give them one. God's basically saying, I'll let them. Uh, I'm going to choose a king that, that is in harmony with what they're after. If they all had the opportunity to choose a king, here's the king that they would choose. 
In fact, look at chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. It said, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was uh, Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, and the son goes on. It says he was a Benjamite. He was a mighty man of power or wealth. And verse 2 says, And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So what, he's, what we're learning here is that when Israel is saying, we want a king to be like us, what they're clamoring for is something like this. They want the most beautiful, the most powerful, the most handsome, the most attractive. And, you know, they're, so they're focused on things that are not important. Not ultimately important, right? He's tall, dark, and handsome. And this is who we want. So it's a reflection of what's going on in the heart of Israel. And so God gives them that king that they would have chosen in a heartbeat, right? Because he knows exactly what they wanted. And so as your uh, notes go on to say here, God chose Saul based on the way the people would have picked their king, powerful outward appearance, and seemingly regal qualifications we just read there. He did this to indelibly impress upon their minds, that is ultimately, that what the world values in a king or a monarch, worldly power, prestige, preeminence, is ultimately ineffectual in God's kingdom. Because what did Saul do? He behaved like a king in the world. He had no regard for God. He did things his own way. Um, he was rash. He was you know, self-centered and so forth. And that's what the following chapters uh, talk about here. Um, trying to see if some... I just don't know what to include and what not to. So let's go ahead in our notes and that'll help us to go forward. Letter E, with Saul's failure, God now picked one. So God says, okay, you clamored for a king, I showed you king that you would choose is not is not going to work so i will go ahead and choose a king for you so now what god is going to do in choosing david is to choose a king that will best represent what it means for a king to rule in the name of the lord does that make sense so he's still trying to work with these people he's still trying to say okay you're clamoring for this it's not what I want. It's not the best case scenario, but I'm going to try to make the best out of it that I can. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose this person, David. And he will at least give you a, an idea of what it means for a king to rule in my name. So in other words, I will still be the ultimate king over Israel, but he will be my king. And he will reflect my will to you. Does that make sense? So David was a good king, right? So, uh, it's, it's called in 1 Samuel 13, 14. If you'll look at that, 1 Samuel 13, 14. This was told to Saul after he was rejected by the Lord for his rebellion. It says, Now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man... What? After his own heart. That's where that phrase comes from. David was a man after God's own heart. Meaning he will at least reflect what it means for God to rule in God's kingdom. So he will be a king sitting on the throne in the name of the Lord. So it was a man after his own heart to rule over Israel as a model of the proper role of an earthly king over God's people. In his selection of David, God stressed that he does not see as man sees. Turn a couple of chapters forward in 1 Samuel 16. And we talked about this a few weeks ago in a lesson, but when God told Samuel to go to Jesse's house, remember, and anoint for him the next king, look at verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him, because... The Lord does not see as man sees. A man looks at the outward appearance. Well, that's what they did with Saul, right? The man looks that way, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's what's going to make a successful kingdom. 
is a person who has a heart after the Lord or a man after God's own heart. And so that's what uh, you're seeing here in the lesson from uh, God choosing David. So back to your notes, it says, Through David's faith and trust in God, he conquered Israel's enemies and ushered in unprecedented victories for God's kingdom. You remember the next chapter in 1 Samuel? What was that about? Yeah, David slays the giant. So it's not about stature. It's not about your ability to go out and to wage physical warfare. It's about your ability to trust in the Lord or your willingness to trust in the Lord, right? And so David says that in his confrontation with Goliath. Uh, you know, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So God exalted David in the sight of all the people, and they perceived that the Lord preserved David wherever he went. So there's some verses there that talk about that. Now, so we're seeing that God is prospering David because of David's trust in the Lord. And so the next phrase in your notes has to do with how David is directing Israel's thoughts to the Lord. So David is kind of a mediator, isn't he? He's doing the Lord's will in faith for the nation, and God is prospering the nation. But at the same time, he's going to reflect or he's going to direct the nation to focus on Yahweh, on, on the true God, right? So it says, Conversely, the good king hastened always to exalt the Lord before the people and ensure the focus of Israel's glory was fixed on Yahweh. Uh, number three there says, David set the standard of faithfulness in his kingdom as he reiterated the truth that God must be recognized as the true sovereign. Not just of Israel, but of all the nations. So I have there, see 1 Chronicles 29, 11, And that's David's prayer, final prayer before he, he dies, really. And he's saying, you know, God, you are the God of gods and Lord of lords again. And you rule your kingdom over all of your creation. Um, and so he's teaching Israel the truth about the Lord. Look at letter A there under number three. God was careful to clarify his ultimate authority over the kings of Israel by means of authoritative prophets sent to counsel, rebuke, and even depose Israel's kings when it was necessary. So here is an important dynamic in God's prototypical kingdom. Um, the prophets of God had the moral authority over the king, didn't they? So the king certainly had the political authority and, and uh, uh, the authority over the armies and such, but that really wasn't what mattered. What mattered was the word of God. And so God sent prophets even to the kings. I mean, it was even Nathan who rebuked David, right? So that's an important consideration here is that God is still ruling ultimately over Israel through his obedient kings, and through his prophets when his kings rebel. Does that make sense? And so that dynamic was very important, the offices of prophet and king. And God was going to be able to work uh, his plan out through those two avenues when the, you know, depending on how the king responded to God's will. And so the final point I make under letter E there says... The New Testament declares that the ultimate son of David, the king, and the final ultimate prophet has arrived in who? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. He is the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. But for our purposes, the ultimate prophet and king. He is the son of David, meaning that he's the king of Israel. But he's more than that. He's also David's Lord, right? Uh, and he's the final prophet. Uh, and we, to him, we yield full allegiance as the true king. That gets us a little bit ahead of ourselves in the class, but you know that's where we're headed, right? That we are part of God's kingdom today. Um, 
That's what the church is. That's what, that's what it means to be in Christ, is to be under His kingship. And that we look to Him as the perfect David, as the perfect prophet. Um, because that's what God has always wanted, was to rule over His kingdom with the true king doing His will. Any comments on any of that? Does everybody see the point that we make there? So the Israel was a failure in that sense, in that it didn't. Uh, idolatry, a lot of rebellion, and a lot of problems until eventually God just took them away, didn't He? And so, in the history, uh, as it as it unfolded. God was going to move forward by making predictions through the prophets of the true David who is to come, the prophet who is to come. And then Israel began to look for that. And you hear the word Messiah a lot. We say that a lot. Well, that was the Hebrew word for the anointed king. Um, and so Israel was always on in anticipation that when is God going to send this great king in the line of David who's going to actually do what he's supposed to do. Because none of the human kings, none of the kings from David has done it, and certainly none of the kings from the north had done it. And so God finally took them away. Uh, well, we know how that unfolded, though, in the birth of Jesus Christ and being the perfect king. Um, so I have on the final part of your outline here, I have... Uh, uh, psalm 89, uh, it's, a, it's such an interesting psalm, especially with the background that we've been talking about this whole class, and we're toward the end of class right now, and so I don't know how much detail we can get into, but it is fascinating in that it, it is a, a basically a capsule summary of the fact that Israel um, had trusted God's promises to... Uh, establish an everlasting kingdom under David. Under David. So God said to David, you know, I'm going to establish the throne of the, the kingdom forever. Um, and so they, they knew that through David and through his sons, God was going to establish the kingdom forever. But they had in their minds Israel. They thought, well, the nation of Israel is going to be the, the final fulfillment of that. But Psalm 89 shows that they came to a stark realization that that's really not how it's going to work out. Because they're seeing the end of Israel before their very eyes. And they're thinking, this, this is not making much sense to us. Because our, our God, who can be trusted, made promises that He's going to establish Israel forever. And somehow, we're getting ready to be destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And so there, it's, a, it's a great, what I call, disorientation. In other words, they're disoriented. They're like, I know the God that I worship is a God who keeps His promises. And I know that the God I worship promised that He's going to establish David's kingdom forever. But I also see over here on this side that we're getting ready to be destroyed. And David's line is no more. So how do you square those two things? Um... Sometimes we don't know how they square, do we? I just want to show you the great transition here. We only have five minutes of class left, but let's look at Psalm 89 and, and see how this is worded. It's, it's very interesting. So for the first 37 verses of Psalm 89, you have praise being offered to God for His rule and reign over His creation. But then it narrows down to His great promises to David. And how trustworthy he is. Um, let's look at verse 19. So they're writing here, You spoke in a vision. There you go, Diane. In a vision. So there was one way he spoke. You spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. And with my oil, holy oil, I have anointed him. 
with whom my hand shall be established. Also my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall never outwit him, nor the wickedness, son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness, my mercy shall be with him. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. And it just goes on and continues to make those kinds of phrases like, he set David up and he said, I'm always going to give him the victory. Yeah, what an honor. That's right. Um, in verse 27, he says, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forever. My covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. So he's even saying, when David dies, I'm going to set up his son, and then his son after him, and, he, and it's just going to be forever. So Israel was thinking, this is how God's going to do it. And uh, we trust in His faithfulness, verse 33. My loving kindness I will not utter utterly take from Him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break. So it's hard to get more stronger terminology than what we're reading here for their faith in the promises of God. And then they look out the window and say, but look what's happening. It's not coming to pass. God's promises seem to be failing. That's verse 38. But you have cast off and abhorred. You have been furious with your anointed. And there it's talking about Messiah as the whole nation. You've been furious with us. You have renounced the covenant of your servant. You have profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. You have broken down all his hedges and brought his strongholds to ruin. And now everybody passes by the way. They plunder him. And he is reproached to his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his adversaries. You've made all of his enemies rejoice. Well, that sounds like the exact opposite of what we read earlier. So there you can see that they're coming to realize that the kingdom of Israel is not going to be the final answer to this plan that God is working out to establish an eternal kingdom. And so they're left with nothing but uh, a, 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 a thread of faith, right? It's like their faith is hanging by a thread. Uh, so they, they cry out, for instance, um, verse 46. How long, Yahweh, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what futility have you created all the children of men? He goes into deep despair in this psalm saying, I don't know what to do with this disorientation. Verse 49, Lord, where are your former loving kindnesses which you swore to David in your truth? Remember, Lord, the reproach of your servants, how I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the many peoples with which your enemies have reproached, O Lord, with which they have reproached the footsteps of your Messiah, of your nation. And that's how the psalm really ends, isn't it? Like there's no resolution to it. Now, just to mention this without getting into the details, the, the next book of Psalms begins in, in Psalm 90, and it begins to piece together the faith of those who recognize that Israel is not going to be the eternal kingdom. And so they, their faith begins to shift to a future hope, that they don't yet understand fully. And that's what was going on when you open the New Testament and the people of Israel are looking for Messiah, right? They're still looking for him. And it was during the days of those in the first century that Messiah did come in the person of Jesus. But it was truly a difficult time for Israel. They were carried into Babylonian captivity. Uh, they eventually was able to come back home and rebuild the temple, but it was never the kind of glory that it was in the days of Solomon, right? There was all kinds of questions. 
but we live in the year 2022, right? So we can look back and say, well, how did all this turn out? And we see the kind of glory that God had in store. It was a long time coming, wasn't it? And Jesus Christ was born in the world, and he did conquer sin and death, and he did establish an eternal kingdom. And in answer to all of these prayers and all of these hopes and dreams and such, uh, and we are recipients of it. And, of course, today we look forward to the consummation of it all when Jesus will return. And sometimes we pray the same prayer, How long, O Lord? How long until you return in order to do away with all this evil and rebellion and usher us into the eternal kingdom in its uh, perfection? Uh, I don't know. I, I think that's an interesting meditation, and uh, I appreciate the comments and questions that we had. But uh, we'll be moving to the next uh, heading next time, and it's going to be called the Kingdom in Prophecy, which we'll be looking at some of the prophetic uh, predictions about the coming of the, the kingdom that we do see realized in Jesus Christ. So that will be where we head next week. Thank you so much for your time. We'll be dismissed. Yes. Surely not. I was just so clear. <laughs> yeah, we didn't get into all of that either. But yes, David committed a sin with Bathsheba. Okay. That that caused the kind of the downfall. The rest of his life was never the same. Okay, because I'm reading and highlighting all this on. You have covered him with shame and, and all this. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but, what does that mean? Yeah, but a lot of that terminology isn't referring only to David. It would be referring to David's house, to David's line of kings, as well as the nation of Israel or nation of Judah, as it was called in later years. So, yeah, we don't want to think that he's just talking about David. David was only co only one covered in shame it's it's the whole, the whole yeah house. yeah okay. i think so thank you sorry about that some of it's uh...
I don't know if it's time or not, but I'm going to get started with the announcements. Maybe. I, got, I found one. I'm going to get started with the announcements. Um, 
I don't want to run too far into uh, Camden's Devo time. I know he's got a, a hot one cooked up, so I don't want to. I don't want to steal his thunder. Um, before I get started in our actual uh, the bulletin prayer list, I did have a couple questions and wanted to go over uh, the men's retreat this weekend. Um, if anybody that hasn't signed up yet that's planning on going, there is a sign up sheet still on the bulletin board out there um, to sign. It's a, I mean, come and go. You don't have to commit. To, I mean, I know several of the young men have things they can't be there till seven o'clock, you know, on Friday afternoon or need to uh, leave at one on Saturday, things like that. That's totally okay. Um, there's four lessons prepared. Um, and so for you to get the entirety of, I guess, the, the uh, concept, um, it'd be great if you could stay the whole time, but you don't absolutely have to stay for the whole thing. Uh, there's also some handouts on the, the table in the foyer. Um, it's at my, my brother's uh, ranch in Salina. Um, there's a, I mean, it's a, we have a house. It's like a 3,400 square foot house. So there's, I think, three king size beds, uh, eight bunk beds, couches, recline. I mean, so there should be plenty of places to sleep. I grabbed a couple of air mattresses too. Um, I would say everybody probably bring uh, a bedroll. I mean, the beds obviously are, you know, have sheets and all that stuff, but in case you're one of the lucky ones that gets to sleep on an air mattress on the floor, a bedroll may be easier. You may prefer sleeping on a bedroll. I don't know. That's up to you. Um, the, uh, we have, you know, full bat three bathrooms, you can shower, you know, so bring toiletries. If you're planning on showering, I'm sure some of the young men, um, probably won't want to shower or do anything the whole time, which is fine. Also, uh, there is a, uh, we have a 12 or 15 acre lake. Um, so you can fish, bring fish and stuff if you want. Um, I know Steve was going to bring a canoe. I was going to grab a, a canoe. Um, we ha I have some rods and reels tackling stuff out there, but, um, you can also feel free to bring your own. We plan on having uh, hamburgers um, Friday evening. Um, Steve said he would do breakfast on Saturday morning, and then um, probably gonna have sandwich like sub sandwiches catered in on Saturday. I'm still working the details out on that. Um, I have a brief list of the things you need to bring. Um, definitely bring a Bible um, and a notepad. Um, the idea of the retreat, as much fun as we can have there, is not to just play. Um, the idea is for us to actually grow um, both together and grow um, in Christ together. Um, and I know uh, the men that have planned lessons have d diligently done so, and I know they'll be beneficial. Um, there's really not else that you need to bring. Steve and I did talk about the only other thing you may want to do. I mean, there's plenty of space to roam, do whatever you want to do, but uh, chiggers uh, and stuff may be a, a, an issue. Uh, there may be water, I mean, water moccasins. I don't know. I never seen any, but you may want to bring boots, long pants, whatever. If you want to just wear shorts, I wear shorts out there 99% of the time. So it's up to you. Um, but that's kind of the low down on that. If you got any more questions, come holler at me. Um, it is be there at whatever time you can. We told Shad we'd hold dinner until he gets there. Uh, cause he said, just work, may catch him up late. So we will not put the burgers on the grill till Shad gets there. Uh, that's the guarantee. And if you need to come go, that's totally fine. Um, if you have any more questions, come get with me. Uh, and please sign up just so I can get a head count. To the normal announcements and prayer list real quick. Um, Ms. Moore, Sammy, she doing better? Seemingly on the road to recovery from the procedure? She might have to have another one. She had one done on her lower back. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Debbie Moore is recovering from one procedure and may have to have another, but uh, we need to be prayerful on her behalf uh, for some healing and recovery. Um, I think we're all aware of Sharon Taylor and Steve Jarvis and, and some of the um, health issues that they face and proceed along procedure for Steve coming up. Um, we also had uh, Kendra Hall, um, a friend or cousin of uh, Sarai, no. This is the baby with brain swell. That's right. Okay. Gotcha. And it, yeah, it was a it was a friend, right? Or a coworker or friend? Okay. Yeah, I remember now. Um. 
so there, I guess good news in that front, but we still need to be prayerful. Um, I can't, cannot imagine having a baby that young with any kind of complications. I've not been down that road, and I'm very thankful I haven't. Um, Jessica Milligan's aunt um, is doing better, but yet still I know may have some difficulties ahead of her, um, as well as Haley's grandmother, uh, Janice. Um, we'll start chemo this week and radiation as well. Just chemo. Um, I can never get that right. I always think it's one and not the other. I apologize. Um, and then Sheena Haskin, Debbie Moore's oldest daughter, is having some more back, is having back problems as well. Need to pray for her. And then uh, we all are also aware of uh, Miss Woods, Robert's sister, um, that is um, in stage four or three cancer. Three. three. I knew it was fairly far along. Yep. So we need to continue to pray for her as well. Um, are there any other? Oh, we also did last week mention um, Shane and Grace's engagement. Um, we need to all continue to uh, pray for them as well. Um, at least I can tell you I wish people had prayed for Haley whenever we were engaged. <laughs> Man, I'm a lucky guy for having you, I'll tell you. Oh. There'll be a sign-up sheet for the Wednesday meal. Um, so the third Wednesday meal will be next Wednesday, um, and we're going to do uh, hot dogs, um, go after the old glizzy, Camden. And uh, it's Camden's favorite. He requested this. He, want, he wanted uh, hot dogs. So we're going to do that, and uh, we're going to grill those. Haley's got a sign-up sheet for all the sides. It should be a good time for all. If you don't like hot dogs, that's the only thing on the menu. <laughs> Sorry. Haley said bratwurst, but... I said, man, it's too hard to do all at once. So we're going to do hot dogs only. And if not, it's a brown paper bag. Uh, anything else? That's right. Man, Veronica is good. My mom's having knee replacement on Friday. Uh, I have butchered it really bad with my family tonight. So you can also add me to the prayer list if you like. Um, but yes, my mother is having knee replacement on Friday. Um, I have not forgotten it, but I forgot to mention it here. So thank you, Veronica. Um, anything else? All right. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord our God, we're so very thankful for the uh, ability to approach your throne in, in prayer. Father, we uh, do so in humility. Father, recognizing you as uh, the creator of all things, the King of Kings. Father, we uh, don't even deserve to be able to lift up our voice to you, but um, through Christ Jesus, you've allowed us to approach you with petition, approach you with uh, our thanks. Father, we are, are so very grateful for that. Father, we're uh, very thankful for the group of Christians that meet here in Farmersville. Father, we ask that you would continue to uh, bless us with all the spiritual blessings that are in Christ. Father, we ask that you help us to reach out to those who do not know Christ, um, that do not know uh, the peace and joy and, and hope that comes in being uh, one of your children. Father, we are very thankful for the leadership here in this congregation. Father, we're very, uh, very, very grateful for both Steve and, and Clint and their uh, willingness to serve. Father, we ask that you would uh, bless them and their families. Father, that you would... Uh, Help each and every one of us to, um, to learn and, and uh, do so in submission and, and meekness unto them, Father. Allow them to, to guide us and, and direct us in, in a path that's pleasing unto you. Father, we're, we're very thankful for the, the word that has uh, been preserved throughout time. Father, the way that we can uh, with 100% certainty know that uh, you've promised us certain things, that you've uh, made a covenant with us. Father, we know that, uh, that your promises are true and just and they always uh, stand. And Father, we are grateful for that, that we don't ever have to guess or, or um, wonder what, what your opinion and your will is regarding this or that, that we can find it in your word and, and that we can take it to the bank and we, we're grateful. Father, we ask that you bless Camden as um, he uh, gets ready to graduate school that you would uh, bless him as he presents a lesson to us tonight. Father, we ask that you would open our hearts and uh, our minds to, to what 
uh, portion of your word he's going to bring forth to us. We ask that uh, it would be edifying to each and every member here. Father, we love you so much. Uh, we thank you for Christ Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, it reads, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. From this passage, we understand that Christians are to be like salt and like light. Salt is a seasoning that influences other things that we eat. It is an influence that improves flavor and adds to the taste of what we are eating. It is not typical for someone to just pick up a salt shaker and just start eating it to appreciate salt. Um, light is something that we use to see other things that are around us. It is an influence that proves our visibility of other objects. It is not typical for someone to just stare at a light source, such as the sun, just to appreciate light. These things are influences for the purpose of um, flavoring or brightening something other than itself. Christians are like salt and light in that they ought to have an influence on those around them. If our influence is not being used for good, then we are like salt that has lost its savor. For our first point, our Christian influence should reflect good, not evil. We must know the difference in between good and evil, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. And then our influence must reflect that which is holy and pure, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Be perfect. And then 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 16, it says, be holy. Our influence must not give a place or opportunity to the devil to speak evil of us, Christ or the church. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, never give place to the devil. And for our second point, our Christian influence is shown through our example of words and actions. The choices that we make have consequences in the lives of other people. And Titus chapter 3, verse 8, it says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to them. Our words and actions must go together. Hypocrites don't have a good influence. James chapter 13, James chapter 3, verse 17, it states, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Examples in the New Testament are in Titus chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. It says, In all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, and doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. And then we have 1 Timothy 4.12. Let no one despise you of your youth, but be an example to the believers in the word, conduct, love, um, spirit, and faith, and impurity. And then for our third point, our Christian influence can be seen through our, our associations, We must not follow a crowd to do evil, Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. And then Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 through 13, it says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. As Christians, we should not associate ourselves with unfruitful works of darkness. We should have no association with evil because it will affect our influence as Christians. And then by not associating with wickedness, we shine the light of truth on that which is wrong. 
In 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 through 7, it says, That which we have seen, here and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Our fellowship should be in the Father and in his children. And for our fourth point, our Christian influence should be obvious to all. We should reflect the excellencies of God in our life. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his only special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Excellence is obvious. If it is not obvious that something is a good influence, then it is not a good influence. If someone does not know you're a Christian, then your influence is not good. It should be obvious to everyone we know whether we are Christian or not. This reminds me of, like, every time I go with my friends, right before I leave, my dad always looks at me and tells me, be a good example you represent the Allen family, not just yourself. So, and I say that all just to say this, whether you consider yourself a Christian or not, someone is always watching you. God watches every single step we take and listens into everything that is coming out of our mouths. When we step foot out of this church building, there should be no difference in how we act. When we step foot out of this church building, we not only represent our family or ourselves, but we also represent our church family and how faithful Christians should act. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15, it says, do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in this world. For our last and final points, our Christian influence will affect our salvation. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Salt that has lost its savor is cast out. If we have lost our influence for good over those around us, then we will be cast out as well. If we do not have a good influence on others, then they will have a bad influence on us. Galatians 5, chapter 9, it says, A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. However, those who have influence for good will be rewarded by God for that good influence. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Matthew chapter 13, verse 43. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. In conclusion, we have discussed our Christian influence. It should reflect good, not evil. It is shown through our examples of words and actions. It can be seen through our associations. It should be obvious to us all, and then it will affect our, our salvation. If you are a Christian but have fallen away, has your salt lost its savor? Is your influence working for good or evil? We offer an invitation at the end of each lesson. If you need anything from the congregation, please come forward and make your needs, needs made known as we stand and as we sing. Someday the record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of life. What will the answer be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Sadly, you'll stand if you're unprepared. Trembling, you'll fall on your knee. Facing the sentence of life or of death, what will your sentence be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Now is the 
time to prepare, my friend. Make your soul spotless and free. Washed in the blood of the crucified one, he will your answer be. What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? The final hymn, number 746. After this song, uh, Brother Steve Wiseman will lead us in closing prayer. Oh, how sweet will be to meet the Lord when He comes in glory by and by. What a song of praise will be outpoured when He comes in glory by and by. <clears throat> how sweet, how sweet when He comes in the sky. What joy, what joy, when He comes in glory by and by. We will have our robes all white as snow, when He comes in glory by and by. Oh, be ready with the Lord to go, when He comes in glory by and by. How sweet, how sweet, when He comes in the sky. What joy, what joy, when He comes in glory by and by. I am longing for that happy day, when He comes in glory by and by. For with Him I hope to soar away when He comes in glory by and by. How sweet, how sweet when He comes in the sky. What joy, what joy when He comes in glory by and by. You get a chance to be sure and encourage these young men who get up here and serve and bring devos and lessons and prayers and all kinds of good stuff Amen. good job tonight brother well done appreciate it let's pray father god thank you for the good day of life thank you for loving us we're grateful father that we have this midweek service that we can be together come out of the world for just this short period of time and we pray father for your strength in your hand as we return back out in the world and help us to be more committed in in proclaiming the gospel father letting our light shine being that salt of this earth father being able to influence those lives around us father for the cause of christ pray your goodness upon those of our number here that are struggling with their health pray your blessings upon them Give them healing and strength. Help us to remember them and place their names before your almighty throne. Father, bless our families that we choose to be holy, choose to not be like this world, and to overcome. We're grateful for the victory in your son, Father. For these things we humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen.